Welcome, Dan. How are you? I'm good. Thanks for having me. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, I was, uh, uh, yeah, you know, we've been, we've talked in the past uh, about about this new film, The Unspeakable Act, and and its subject matter and what it is. And I and, and and I was especially kind of sensitive to it because it has that kind of thing, which is such a sensitive plot. Devi- not device, but it's a, like a central to the plot, the, their relationship between brother and sister, uh, Jackie and Matthew. And, you know, I wasn't sure, should I be talking about it very, you know, blatantly? And would it be a spoiler for people? Uh, you know, they have a, a you know, it, it, at least as far as Jackie's concerned, she has incestuous feelings for her brother. But, you know, how but, is that? You know, it comes out in the first line of dialogue or the first bit of voiceover the whole idea of the film is to bop you with that really fast and right. take it from there. Mm-hmm. And I and definitely it does you know, I mean, what you said is true. It, it it plays down towards more mundane, more normal stuff rather than go going into the gothic promise of, you know, of a brother sister incestuous relationship. Which, right. And and that's that's on purpose actually uh, uh, Truffaut once um talked about the uh the the principle of contradiction that you Mm -hmm. all you all if you start with something really simple that's when you're supposed to go towards the crazy stuff if you start with something that promises to be outrageous you've got to play it down towards reality yeah and this is great because if you start with something outrageous like incest what's waiting to catch you the safety unit waiting to catch you underneath is the family and the family with its infinite interest and complexity is 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 what you know the film winds up being about you know about the way people are with each other in a family about the kind of the, the kind of the ways they carry the past with them about the kind of things they do that seem crazy if you just see them for a few seconds but if you think about it for a moment have to be that way because they've been living together so long yeah well it, and so i guess the title the unspeakable act is almost ironic because well because it doesn't happen <laughs> because it well that no that's a spoiler it's but a, but but, but a, also um, because it really ends up being an emotional, just a natural relationship between two siblings. Uh, very different than the t- typical. It's a very taboo subject, of course, but it's it's. it turns out that these are normal kids. Yeah. I mean, with normal... If they don't feel normal, I lose, you know right, I mean? If, right. if, and if you can't, if the audience members can't relate yeah, to it, those feelings. Exactly. I mean, I'm very happy for them not to relate to things in certain circumstances. I like to set up situations where you're wondering what could possibly be going on in Jackie's head. Mm -hmm. But the name of the game here is, you know, to start with something that seems beyond the pale. And if, you know, no part of it should eventually feel beyond the pale. Mm -hmm. Not only eventually, but right away, I want want it to not feel beyond the pale. It doesn't feel beyond the pale. It feels... um before the pale, I mean, yeah. <laughs> and you know that's in large part due to your casting of uh, these amazing actors who are so natural and uh, so so just deliver in this very sort of there's no hysteria, there's no, and there could so easily be, you know, it's a, just a, such fine tuned performances. So let, this ha- film lucked out big time with its casting. Well, could, I don't, I don't know, maybe it's luck, or maybe it's just you know a good director, filmmaker who is has a good eye for casting. It's always got to be a little bit of everything. I mean, it's not as if I didn't try to play it down. It's not as if I didn't always have in mind that I wanted a, a certain kind of, you know, restraint and things happening under the surface. But I wrote something that could easily have fallen on its face. That's what, yeah. In a couple of different ways. Right. The casting, the location, all those things were in no way assured. So it, it was really a kind of a lucky, the, the element of luck is... It's very strongly present in my mind as I watch the movie. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and and also it could have fallen on its face just from a, purely from a, the the you know the promotion of the film and from how it's received just because you have that 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 the term so you're going to automatically sort of have well that's uh, like re- I mean maybe that's gonna my happen films anyway. have always fallen on their oh, okay. face and so I that to me if I get a film in the can that is so to speak there are no cans anymore that that is that is good. Mm-hmm. I was completely prepared to have a fall on its face. The fact that it's getting into a couple of festivals is a total novelty for me, let me tell you. Yeah. Well, 
let's talk about the uh, let's talk about the casting because I think the casting is what what like I said what is so special one of the things that's very special about the movie. So then the lead role is Jackie who is finishing high school or right she's get you know mm-hmm. getting towards uh, the application. Well maybe she's not. Yeah, she's going from she's a going junior year to a senior. senior. That makes sense because she's going through the starting the application process for right. college herself and so uh, and Jackie uh, is played by Tally Medell. Now how how did that come about? She was magnificent. Tally who is indeed magnificent was um, recommended to me by the filmmaker Joe Swanberg who um, I think has got an exceptional eye for actors uh, really everybody he recommended for me was was really worthy uh, but uh, he, he had seen her he didn't, he didn't actually know her but he'd seen her in a in a, a short film that she did at the Sidewalk mm-hmm. uh, Moving Pictures Festival down in Alabama mm-hmm. and she won an award for that film and he uh, had struck up an email conversation with her and recommended her to me and I saw a bit of a web series that she did, um, directed by the same guy who did the short film, this guy Daniel Shaner, too, who was her first director, who, who worked with her quite a lot. I see. Um, and uh, it, it was cause my, my mouth dropped open to, to see what she was doing in this, mm-hmm. in this little thing. The, yeah. The, did she have training? In, in, uh, or? Yeah, she's, she's, yeah. she's not. I mean, she certainly a, comes across as, you know. Like, she's not an amateur at all, but she's, right. her training tends, is not, she's done a lot of improv, She's a comedian. She has a comedy dance troupe. She <laughs> has a she was part of this comedy radio troupe. She's part of wow. dance. So a lot of her a lot of her um, gigs mm-hmm. are are not so much you know not like you know playing Hamlet or something. Although she she does play and plays, mm-hmm. but I think a lot of it is kind of a, a looser kind of audience oriented thing. And she's a really distinctive actor. I've I've worked with I've worked with really good actors but I never worked with anybody quite like her yeah who yeah she she well, she has a um a, 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 a sort of a whole just uh, personality and a um very distinctive and and and, and a um she, she, and a look she and an intensity yeah. I mean all of, she's the whole package that's that's what he's right talking with Dan Salit whose uh, new film The Unspeakable Act is going to have its premiere at uh, BAM Cinema Fest here in New York Correct, New, New York yeah, premiere, yeah. as New well York, as Brooklyn, New, obviously. New York premiere. It's only yeah. the, it's only the second uh, festival. Space. Sarasota was the first. Sarasota oh, was terrific. the first. Yeah, and um, and and it's going to premiere on uh, Sunday, June twenty fourth at nine thirty at BAM. So go to BAM dot org and get a ticket. Uh, don't wait too long because I think it's gonna it's gonna be a sellout, uh, mm-hmm. especially after this <laughs> this interview gets out. Um, and and so let's continue though because uh, her older college bound brother who she's in love with is uh, Matthew. Uh, the character's name Matthew and is played by Sky Hirschkron. Did yeah, I get that right? Sky yeah. Hirschkron. He's also terrific. He's, tr- he's, um, he's terrific. an actor too, right? And I mean, he is not an actor. What? I mean, he has, no, he has, um, I'm, I'm not sure whether he's actually done much acting in the past or hopes to do much in the future. What he is is a, he's a fellow film buff and I, I met him when he was 16 years old and uh, tearing up the festival circuit seeing like a thousand movies a year mm-hmm. really smart kid and a really good filmmaker he's made three short films that you can find them online if you look hard and uh, I think he's really like exceptional he was he's a friend of mine he's somebody who read treatments of this um, film years ago without my ever thinking he was going to be involved Did in you, it do you always have him in mind for the I, I never had him in mind for really? because I didn't really think of him as an actor. He, he, yeah, you know, but he, I, I definitely thought of him as like somebody, a, a fellow filmmaker and a sympathetic ear in terms of like what I was trying to do. I know that he comes from a lot of, has a lot of similar, um, you know, ideological touch points in film to me. Mm-hmm. There are di- lines of dialogue in the movie that, you know, he gave me years ago when uh, he was reading the. He was reading the treatments and made suggestions. They're in there. Other act, other characters are saying his lines of dialogue that he gave me. And yeah, you know, we were just talking one day as I was in the casting process, and he said, "I'll read for it." Huh. And I was actually having trouble casting that role because I was having trouble getting people to hold back in the way that I wanted that character to hold back. Mm-hmm. I wanted I wanted people to keep it inside, and it. It's not always the most natural thing for actors to do what I was asking. It was really hard for me to convey it. And I was trying all kinds of things, and it was not. I was not finding a, 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 enough of a basilisk stare. I wasn't finding enough of a pulled-in, behind-the-surface kind of performance. Yeah. And Sky, who, I, you know, is a really smart kid, approached it as an artist, or I think more than as an actor, showed no inclination to do actorly things at all when I see him working I, I see him 
thinking about it as an artist, thinking about it in terms of my art because he knows my movies and felt sympathetic to them. So I, I see somebody who's like, you know, working at exactly the place where I was working from, which is interesting, that gap between director and actor that is often there wasn't really there in that case. Wow. And and the mother was also like, a, yeah. what, a, what a great casting. Um, Andrea Fair, who, who is really good and who is uh-huh. the other role that I felt like I was trying to get people to to not show me stuff. And I was having trouble getting people to show me as little as I wanted shown. I was telling people... Is that like indicating? Is that what that's called? Some, in yeah, some circles? I guess, I guess in you, those theatrical circles? I guess you could call it indicating. I mean, it's very normal when you're an actor to take... Mm-hmm. internal feelings and externalize them to some extent it's certainly what you want to do as a child when you want to be an actor is you want to take what's inside you and put, sure. it, put it out there right at large and you know training obviously modifies that and, and you know I, in my experience actors are not like infantile people they, they are working in a fairly sophisticated you know member of the process part of the process mm-hmm. but it's still really hard to get people to really suck it all the way back and this was a mother role, which comes with a certain amount of cultural mythology. I was telling people, pretend you're like a stoical Midwesterner, even though that wasn't necessarily what I had in mind. I was telling people, um, you know, pretend you're playing in our town or something. It, yeah. I was having trouble getting people to, to, to take it back. And, and Andrew, who I found under the strangest circumstances, you know, I just like saw some photos of her on a casting site. And it, she, I, I, I called her in to read because she just looked so totally different and out of place among all these other 200, you know, submissions that I got. She never was tempted to to do anything except, you know, keep that stuff to herself. It, it's, her, it's her nature to, yeah. to, 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 you know, just like let, let me wonder what's going on in her head was what I wanted. Matthew and um and Jackie have a an, a sister named yeah. uh, <laughs> uh play, play, named Jean played by uh, Katie Schwartz. Yeah, um, Katie Schwartz. Yeah, who, who's wonderful and who you have such um, a smile on your face. Just yeah, talking about she, these guys. Oh, she's terrific, and yeah. she and she. I found her just like in the most classic way. You know, she was. I was going to a play to check out another actor who um turned out to be the uh, assistant director of the film, Mark J. Parker. But she had a small role in this play. It was not too big a role, actually. But I, I made a note in the margin of the of the playbill that said Jean, which is the name of her character. She just seemed like that character. And so I found her in the most, you know, the, mm-hmm. the most uh, Hollywoodish way, you know. Right. And uh, you know, Schwab's a very Schwab's moment for her. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, she's wonderful. Yeah, it's must again. It must kind of be nice to be able to sort of, um, sort of have that, you know, like. Uh, sort of not power, of course, it's but it, it is still. It's like a little playing god because it you is get power to, and it's it is tough because you you you're, you're like you know you could just say gee you know I mean and just pluck someone out and really it's not you know, nice because you turn down so many people and, well, you, yeah. and you turn down people who are really good and you turn not down if you people. avoid the, the, <laughs> the no. auditioning process if you do that but no but yeah I I mean I turn down people who are good or who you like a lot or yeah. It's it's actually kind of painful, and I I, I don't really uh, some part of me really makes more trouble for myself because I so I hate, hate you know, turning people down casually. I really put a lot of effort into it sure. to, just to give them every possible. And then the uh, therapist uh, yeah. is the I guess the last and, of the. Uh, and the therapist is somebody who I've seen in as in, a therapist? in the movies of my. No, she's certainly oh. not a therapist. Um, but uh, I keep people keep, people keep asking me that. People keep, <laughs> people keep thinking she has to be a real therapist because she's a good actor. <laughs> my friends uh, Sherry Berman and Chris Benker who are both filmmakers. Sherry was um, uh, one of the producers in the film, and they've both worked with Carrie. And uh, several times, Carrie has a, a lead role in, in my friend Sherry's uh, movie, My Life is Abraham Lincoln, which is just finishing now. And I've known her for years uh, through that connection. So that was a that was a case where she, Carrie's actually really she's she's done she's worked in theater for a while. She's you know a really seasoned actress, and she was awesome to work with. Mm. We we shot her two days of work in like part of one day. She just came in new. You know, it was perfect, knew everything. We just went through everything really, really quickly. Really, real pleasure to work with and a really, really great person, too. Uh, actually, I, let me correct myself. The last character I actually wanted to ask about was the, the this house, that <laughs> the uh, house. this house in Brooklyn, uh, house. which appears to be, just from looking at it, like it's in Ditmas Park or... 
And Somewhere it, around there. Yeah, you I could tell you, that. This. You could call it Ditmas Park, and you could call it Midwood, which I think I used to. And when I looked it up, I felt, uh, I got the feeling that it should properly be called Midwood Park, this little tiny stretch between Foster and Glenwood, um, which I think all the houses there might have been built by the same architect who was throwing up, like, found a way to make a lot of houses all at once, prefabricated or partially prefabricated houses. Mm -hmm. So there's a couple blocks there where one guy did everything, and that, that's called Midwood Park. Oh, okay. And, uh, well, it's a great house. Yeah, it is. My, porch my friend Gil Schuster lives there, who I've known for a long time. That house was the um, was the location of the Brooklyn Woodstock, which some uh, some aging New Yorkers might remember as a, as a kind of a, an event. Gil... Uh, Gil is a musician, and his brother died of AIDS back in the 80s, and he started having benefits in his backyard. He'd invite bands mm -hmm. into his backyard and, and raise money for AIDS. And uh, we've all hung out in that house some over the years, and um, it's amazing. Those, those old houses are... I wonder how long anybody I know is ever going to be in them. They, they seem like things from the past. Let's play another bit of the clip um, while... Well, we can here, and uh, we'll come back in a second. Uh, again, it's Dan Salit, whose film, The Unspeakable Act, is uh, is going to have its New York premiere. Congratulations at uh, at BAM on Sunday, June twenty fourth at nine thirty. Here's another bit of the film. Anything you want about him to anyone you want, because no one wants to go there. People will bend over backwards to put the blandest possible interpretation on whatever you say. Why won't you come with me? I don't see any need to stand waiting outside the subway station. You don't even know when he's going to he's arrive. He's on his way now. I'm going. You're making too big a fuss over this, Jacqueline. What I would like to try, actually, is the unmentionable act. The I-word. But that concept doesn't go over so well with Matthew. I wouldn't bother you? Totally not. If I loved a boy, I would do anything for him. I would never say no to anything. You're the last of the romantics. Romantic with a capital R. Um, one other person I should be asking about, because uh, uh, it's such a gorgeous film, is uh, the cinematographer. Yeah. Uh, what a beautiful, lush who, film it is. Who hasn't seen the movie yet. I'm wondering, no? I'm wondering what he'll think of it. I'm wondering if he'll approve of my, uh, my uh, homemade uh, color correction. But uh, the cinematographer's name is Duray Munajim. I've worked with him several times. He, he shot my last movie, All the Ships at Sea, and he was the first AC assistant camera on uh, Honeymoon, mm -hmm. the film before that. So he and I have the longest history of anyone. Well, let's also say, but I think I may have mentioned it, but that both of your those films, uh, mm -hmm. when this All the Ships at Sea and ships Honeymoon, yeah. And the, Honeymoon are both available on Amazon on demand mm -hmm. in the sense yeah. that you can... Amazon Instant Video, I think they call it. Instant Video. But so you, you can, can download it or stream it. You can it. buy it. For a few bucks, or you can yeah, it's like two fifty to buy it a dollar yeah. ninety nine to stream it or something. It's terrific, yeah. So. Mm -hmm. But um, but Duraid, um, I think knows how to. I don't think he normally lights in the way that I like lit, but he understands what I want want done. I I always, you know, ask him to try to light the films like Nestor Almendros. I like these really kind of soft. You know, kind of shades of gray. I like, you know, light that looks like it's reflected. I don't like anything that's very dramatic or very high key. And uh, and uh, he did a really nice job with it. And he had he, he, he had bought a few months before a camera, Sony F3, which I think came out in April. And we were shooting in June, so it was pretty new. And uh, it was super sensitive to light. gave a really nice image. And I loved that camera. And it, it really... It's the way I like to light, it makes it, it simplifies Achieve. it so much. It, it, that is a, I mean, Brooklyn has never looked more beautiful. I have to huh. say, which really. is funny because we were thinking we we left everything the way it is, and mm -hmm. and Duray's, uh slogan was one decrepit thing in every shot because, you know, we didn't we didn't have art direction to like try to make the house look like house beautiful. Yeah. It, it was a, it was a lived in house, and as it turns out, the the beauty of it is impressing everybody. But we were. We were like treating. We were trying to take it warts and all, but it's a, it's a it's a nice looking house any way you cut it. And, uh, yeah, and obviously. I, the way that the way that Duraid and and the gaffer Kim Collada uh, lit it is really um, brings out the color. I mean, the colors seem very intense because of the kind of soft lighting that they use. So it, it comes out looking pretty pretty cool. Yeah. What, <clears throat> at what point did you become a filmmaker, and what what led up to that? I mean, how did you? 
Did you go to film school or did you were just? I did eventually go to film school. I, uh-huh. went, I went to college as a math Shows. major. Actually, I, I, I wanted to be a mathematician. And the first year, my freshman year in college, I, I became a film buff in a fairly serious way. I went from like zero to you know, I started seeing like hundreds and hundreds of films a year. It's a pace I kept up a long time. Um, and I think I decided halfway through college that I was going to go to film school. And then after undergraduate, I went to UCLA. But, but going into film for me is like inextricably making films is inextricably linked to my you know being immersed in film history and yeah. and and you know loving other people's films so it's very much you know that background is not separate for me in any way being a film lover and being filmmaker, a film lover, they're, they're they're the two sides of the same it's, coin it's totally optional mm-hmm. i think that there are most of the great filmmakers who've ever lived would not say anything like that. They they didn't necessarily come from that kind of background. They were like, you know, whatever. They were cowboys. They were engineers, whatever. They worked in vaudeville. But for me, it's it's got... It, it, the fact that I love other people's films and, and love film history is, is completely the same impulse as wanting to make a movie myself. For me, I'm a... I'm a film buff first, you know. Yeah. And so what, the experience of with this film has that, I mean, being able to do a little bit, because it's gotten obviously some attention and a little bit more play than yeah. the prior your prior film. So Already. that must be, yeah. So that must be very gratifying that you're able to go to a festival where there's all these other film geeks. Because let's face it, film festival <laughs> filmmakers and independent filmmakers are generally like yeah. Of li- of like mind and then and are huge film buffs generally and they will see everything because their love for it always means a little more to me when somebody sees the film who's like immersed in film history because mm-hmm. that's kind of what I want I don't really necessarily want to you know run Hollywood or make a big budget film but I I want to like kind of enter film history in some modest way I would like to like be part of the discourse and so. I'm always I, I care a lot about my my community of all us kind of like you know stunted film buffs who, who you know see yeah. way too many movies and don't learn how to do the normal <laughs> things in life until way too late. Yeah, <laughs> and so it, it, it's at BAM and um, uh, wisely chosen um, uh, by the folks at BAM, uh, and it is. Uh, what, what, do you? Did, do you know what it's playing um, up on the same night? Is it paired um, I don't, up with I don't the... remember what else. I think maybe the comedy, which I haven't seen. Oh, um, well, that's a great show. Great it, one. Yeah. It, I Rick, think... Rick is going to, Rick Alverson, who's. You're right. Is coming on. He'll be on in a few weeks. I think Caitlin Scheel is in that film, right? Who has a small role in, in my movie. Right. Um, yeah, and... well, that's sort of like, I don't know, like. She's sort of like saying you had a cinematographer on your staff. Uh, no, you know, Kate, Kate, crew, cause Kate's there's, in there's, everything yeah, right now. Yeah. And, but For has, a good reason, has, has anyone talented. ever been more deserving of it? No, I'm going to call this Caitlin Shield Radio. It, <laughs> because everybody who comes here has a Caitlin Shield movie? Well, they should. Has but anyone ever been more deserving? She is, she's really she is probably like the, the, the best actress in America maybe right now, I wow. think. And I don't think people maybe have got on to it yet, but she's amazing. Uh, yeah, and she has another uh, that's going to be at Rooftop Films called Sun Don't Shine, where she's actually I've carrying a movie. I've for, seen for Sun once. Don't yeah. Shine. Totally different performance from anything else and amazing. She's like both yeah. really intellectual and really visceral at the same time. Sexy, too. Um, <laughs> and um, very good. And and welcome to Pine Hill. Is, welcome to Pine Hill. It's playing, I think, the day before me. Day before. It's a really nice film that I saw down at Sarasota. Um, yeah, I think that's on the 23rd, Keith Miller's okay, film. Okay, yeah, and Keith's coming on next next week, mm-hmm. so I'm kind of multitasking here a little bit, yeah, trying to I, also get those guys. I've plugged. seen only a few of the BAM films in the lineup, but it looks like it looks like uh, Florence and uh, David did a really nice job selecting really interesting movies. Well, they always do. Um, the BAM Cinefest really is the cream of the crop, I think, you know, and that's why I always look forward to it. Um, thanks for coming by. I really appreciate it. We'll Thank say it again, you. Dan Salit, whose film... The Unspeakable Act will be at BAM on, uh, sept- I'm sorry, June 24th. June 24th. Sun- Sunday, June 24th at 9.30. Uh, so you can visit BAM.org and purchase tickets. And I would suggest you do so. Don't miss this special film. Um, thank you very much, Dan, for coming on. Thanks to the guys at, uh, oh, you know, what? we have a minute left. I'm going to just plug a couple of things coming up at FilmWax uh, Film Series. Uh, on Monday, June 18th at 8 o'clock, Film Wax is back at Franklin Park Movie Night uh, in Crown Heights with the documentary 
Sons of Perdition, uh, directed by Tyler Meesom and Jenilyn Merton. And I know Jenilyn will be Jenilyn will be there for the Q and A. Um, and on Thursday, June twenty first, eight o'clock, Film Wax will was proud to be part of uh, the Northside Festival for part of their film uh, presenting a film block on their closing night on Thursday, June twenty first. And Film Wax will be showing a documentary short called Figure Father, directed by Andrew Ellis, and then um, which is really powerful. And then that's being followed by David Soul's film uh, feature documentary, uh, Puppet. And um, so we will be there, and it's at Union Docks. Again, I think it's at 8 o'clock. Yes, it's at 8 o'clock on Thursday, the 21st of June. Um, and so I want to thank Northside for the, for, and Elle Magazine for inviting us to that. Uh, thank you, Dan, and thank you to Donna and uh, everybody here at at, uh, B- at bboxradio.com. This is Adam Shartoff. Uh, you've been listening to another episode of Film Wax Radio. Thank you very much. <laughs>